And I see that it is 5.30. So I'd like to open this meeting for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, regular meeting for October 5th, 2023. Holly, would you take roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill phoned and he is running late, but will be here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Foles. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Okay. Um, for members of the public that are uh, in attendance remotely, um, this is the closed session, which we will be having from 5.30 until 6.30. The open session is from 6.30 until we conclude. So given that, um, I'm not aware of any changes that we have to the closed session agenda. Um, Holly, is the staff senior staff member here? <laughs> no, there are no changes okay. to closed session. All right, uh, oral communications regarding uh, the one item that we have in closed session. Does any member of the public wish to comment on that? Um, seeing none, um, we will adjourn now to the closed session to the public. Uh, please rejoin at 6.30 and we will see you then. Oh, okay. The, the, the green ring right now. So good to go. I just had a unit. I just unmuted it. Okay. this meeting of the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for October 5th, 2023. Holly, would you take roll again, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Foles. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. And um, <clears throat> we have nothing to report out as far as any actions taken in the closed session. Um, before we uh, go to any changes in the agenda, I wanted to um, just briefly go over um, something that's in our board policy manual. After the last meeting, uh, which was a bit um, uh, 
chaotic or uh, uh, bouncing around a lot. Uh, I wanted to just uh, reiterate a few things, and I'm doing this more as much for myself because I'm letting it happen. Uh, so just wanted to uh, review with everybody, and I'm going to be more diligent about trying to make it happen so that it's not as chaotic as last time. Um, board members are uh, uh, given the opportunity uh, for uh, one opportunity for comment from each director after presentation from the staff. Uh, generally public comments then, if there are any, followed by an additional opportunity for comment from each director. Um, each director uh, shall be recognized by the chairperson before speaking. Um, we do a lot of interjecting and talking over each other to the point that uh, some of the members of the public have stopped us in that saying, we have hearing difficulties. We can't hear you when you're talking over each other. And I'm guessing also for members of the public that are attending remotely, it gets difficult then to hear. So uh, we need to follow that uh, protocol. Um, each director may seek additional information or comment from the staff on any question. However, the right of any director to be heard is limited to the particular topic or item of business at issue. Uh, if I can see that we're straying off into the broccoli fields, I'm going to uh, do what I can to check that and bring us back to uh, the item that we're uh, talking about. If I stray off into the broccoli field, um, I'll ask the other directors to check me also. Um, the chairperson uh, shall endeavor to confine the debate <laughs> to the question under discussion, shall not roll out and shall roll out of order any irrelevant or repetitious comments by directors or members of the public to the extent permitted under the Brown. So um, with that, I'd like to then uh, continue with the meeting. Um, any changes to the agenda, uh, Mr. Rogers? Uh, Chair Spillan, I'd just like to make a, a quick announcement. Earlier in the week, I notified the board that Kendra Reed, the district's finance manager, had submitted her resignation of employment to the district. Tonight will be Kendra's last appearance as finance manager uh, in front of the board. This is a huge loss to the district as Kendra has been an extremely valuable member of the management team. And I really want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, from the board, uh, we say thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to? Yeah. Uh, I do have something um, I'd like to say. So I have been with the district for eight years, and this place and my coworkers have become my family. Um, I deeply care for the district and have valued my time here and all I have learned. Um, with that said, I will be moving on to a position that will be less public and board facing and will be overall better for my mental health. Um, when taking the position of director of finance, I had to navigate learning new things and dealing with the board for the first time. Um, the, extent, the extensive scrutiny, criticism, and in my personal opinion, disrespectful behavior towards staff and other board members from director Fultz has taken a toll. I want to be fully transparent, and I know I'm not alone in this stance, and I would hate for another valuable staff member to have to make the same decision to move on and put the district in an even more vulnerable place. Uh, I appreciate all of this support I have received thus far, and I am truly going to miss this place. Thank you, Kendra. Um, as the uh, chair of the Budget and Finance Committee and the board member that's dealt with uh, Kendra the most over three years that uh, Director May has been here. I'd like her to speak. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you, Kendra, for your many years working for the district. And even before you jumped into the challenging job of Director of Finance. And when we asked you to do that, um, we realized that that was requiring you to take on an unfamiliar tasks related to capital planning, budgeting, and then the horrible, horrible thing, the rate study. Um, and so both Director Hill and I, who are on the Budget and Finance Committee, have been really impressed by the hard work 
um, that you undertook and and your growing mastery of all of this material. And um, so we're very sorry to see you go. I'm also very sorry to hear what you just told us. Um, and I think that um, it's very brave of you to say it because it's not always easy um, to say things like that in public. Um, and But I had previously when I talked to you, you made it clear that it wasn't the whole board that was the problem. It was a single member of the board. And Rick Rogers had earlier told me that he moved his retirement date up to early November because he could no longer tolerate the impact having to deal with Director Fultz was having on his health. So we're now as a board in the position of scrambling to find an interim district manager and an interim director of finance on short notice entirely because of the damaging behavior of Director Fultz. His treatment of staff has been a longstanding problem and it threatens the future of the district. I regret that I haven't done something about it before this, um, but I think that the board needs to address it directly and publicly. And for this reason, I regretfully make a formal request to the board president to put a discussion of this issue on the agenda for the next board meeting. Okay, uh, we will discuss that at the next board meeting. It's not on the agenda tonight, so we will discuss it then. Uh, please submit whatever you have as far as the summary memo. Okay, uh, moving on to formal communications. Uh, this is a portion for any members of the public who wants to speak on an issue that's not on our agenda tonight, that is part of the district's um, purview of, of operations. Um, and I'd like to remind members of the public that this is limited to uh, three minutes in length. So uh, does anybody here have anything that they want to cover? Um, I do have a question about it being on the agenda. I'm not seeing anything specific for uh, the Hermosa project. Is that something that's been discussed this evening? Um, I believe that's part of the engineering uh, department. Uh, yeah, there's an update in my okay. memo. Okay, we can cover that um, towards the end of the end of the meeting. Then, as part of the engineering uh, department uh, update. Okay. Um, I do see several members of the public uh, online who want to comment uh, about something that's not on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Dolson. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So um, I attend all the board meetings. I, I rarely uh, comment, but in this case, I, I do have something I'd like to share. And in addition, based on the uh, remarks that have just been made, I, I want to say that I, I appreciate um, what uh, President Smalley's intentions are in controlling the meeting. And um, I'm similarly very, very sorry to hear about Kendra's departure. I think that's a, a huge loss for the district. Um, I'll leave it at that. The, the, co the comment I want to make really is um, based on the previous meeting, there was um, a comment by a director which which really concerned me there, and it actually fits in with some of the things people are talking about, because the um, I would urge the board to, to seriously address this, to put it on the agenda as well, and, and gain some clarity on this issue. The claim was made that, that repetitious and tangential remarks by board members are, are actually a good thing, because they serve to inform the public, and that that's actually part of what board meetings are intended to accomplish. And my understanding is, is quite different. It's that the sole purpose of board meetings is, is for the board to expeditiously you know, provide the district with essential guidance that's as well informed as possible. And uh, the public is certainly free to witness the deliberations, to provide oral and written input. But there's no legitimate basis for directors to treat board meetings as, as a stage that they can use to address the public. This distracts the board from its mission. It, it makes meetings longer, more tedious for board members and the public alike. And so, I urge the board to take this under consideration. But but lastly, I, I want to suggest that the board should not engage in any immediate comment on or discussion of, of what I've just said, because this would just be another example of the behavior that I'm objecting to. Thank you. Okay. Um, other members from the public that want to speak on something that's not on our agenda tonight? 
Cynthia's in Denzel. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. I would like to um, agree with what Mark said. I had been wondering why Rick Rogers was planning to leave sooner than what he had indicated earlier. And I think most of us were very worried about that. Um, and to know that it has to do with uh, discomfort with the attitude of one of the directors uh, makes us feel even worse. Um, I am sorry that I personally haven't expressed more appreciation. For Cynthia, Cynthia. Yes. Cynthia, um, I, I'd like to convey or uh, have that discussion next week. Um, I think your comments are, are veering off into what I don't want to discuss this evening. I'd like to deal with that next week. Okay. I just wanted to express appreciation for Director, um, for Manager Rogers. Thank you. Can I, point, point of clarification, though, I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that oral communication for items not on the agenda is for not items not on the agenda, and it's not your preference about what people say. So I, I think we have to be okay. careful about that. Uh, but it's something that we will cover. Correct. But week. but it's yeah. Okay. She's, um, she's right. <laughs> um, seeing no others on the. Uh, we can move on then. I'm not seeing anybody else right now. Um, the unfinished business then. Oh, uh, yes, unfinished business. The revenue model uh, to be used for the 2023 rate study. Rick is the finance manager will introduce this side. Can <clears throat> Okay, so the 2023 rate study by Raph Tellis um, was the consultant company contracted to undertake this study, study um, relayed their goals of the rate study at the July 13th, 2023 meeting, which was a workshop um, and rates one on one to kind of go over you know, how a rate study is conducted and the process. Um, the first financial plan presentation was brought to the board on September 7th, and uh, a discussion was had. Um, and then at the September 12th Budget and Finance Committee, uh, more discussion was covered, and there were a few you know, minor changes that resulted in the final presentation at the September 14th uh, board, special board meeting. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that the public was invited to both the September 7th and 14th meetings, and the district did reach out to, you know, its largest users, uh, Bear Creek Estates, schools, mobile home parks, um, to encourage people to attend and provide their input to those meetings. Uh, based on comments from members of the public and the board members from the September 14th meeting, uh, staff worked with Rock Tellis to slightly modify the models presented at that meeting to, to arrive at the final versions presented herein. Um, so we'll start with the water financial plan. Um, this is basically the same financial plan as scenario one presented at the uh, 914 special board meeting. Um, this includes the 25 million in capital expenditures that are um, spread out over the five year rate period. Um, for CZU fire recovery and other natural disasters, recovery spending, and, um, and other unforeseen repairs and maintenance. Uh, staff is recommending this financial plan instead of the scenario two, which is the higher capital spending for disaster recovery um, presented at the 914 board meeting for the following reasons. Um, scenario one would result in smaller revenue adjustments needed. Um, the revenue adjustments would be 10% for the first two years, 7% for the three following years, 
as opposed to the other scenario, which would be the 12% for the first two years, 10% for the two following years, and 6% for the fifth year um, under the scenario two plan. Uh, it, the reserve levels, um, there is more reserve fund coverage under the first scenario. And um, our historical capital spending is limited to staff bandwidth. So basically, with the retirement of, gen of the general manager, the loss of um, our district engineer, Josh, in June, and now with my resignation, uh, this will dis decrease the district's capacity to plan, bid, and manage the capital projects until the replacements are up to speed. Um, and Garrett is obviously, you know, getting up to speed, but he's, you know, still... Uh, you know, getting used to all the projects. So it's, it, you know, it's going to take a lot more um, for, you know, a collaborative effort to come together. Uh, so the next slide. So this is just showing um, uh, kind of a rundown of the scenario one and showing the revenue adjustments that are needed. And this also uh, assumes the $19 million debt issuance in fiscal year 2024. There'll be no change to the fire recovery surcharge and it assumes um, 25 million over five year period of disaster recovery spending. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit now more about capital expender, expenditures and the debt issuance. So in fiscal year 2024, we have 24 million in capital spending um, slated for that. So most of that funding is already in contract, um, 15, about 15.2 million in loan funded projects. Um, so that makes up the majority. There's a 3.8 in other FEMA projects and 3.1 a million in grant funding. Um, so the need for uh, capital expenditure coverage uh, requires us to issue debt and that's 19 million at four and a half percent for a 20, 20 year loan. Um, this, this debt issuance provides cash flow coverage to um, cover any of the capital expenditures that are needed um, with the lag of the FEMA reimbursement coming in. Uh, we chose a conservative 20 year loan because it results in higher annual debt service and um, Issuing debt will spread the cost of recovery over the 20 years. So it's not, um, if we weren't to do this, if we weren't to issue debt, we would need higher revenue adjustments to cover um, all of the capital expenditures. Um, and then this just shows the, the breakdown of the um, capital financing. So you'll see in the first fiscal year 24, um, the remaining loan, loan proceeds in the dark gray is the majority of the loans that are in contract. Um, and then there's a few of the grant funding and then the light gray will show the how much is going to the new debt. Um, and then this is just showing the dotted line is if we're at our current revenues, we stay at our current revenues, we won't have sufficient um, revenue to cover our operating debt service and um, capital projects. Uh, for the wastewater financial plan, uh, this one is actually going to be differ from the three scenarios that were presented in the 914 meeting. Um, these, this, this scenario is assuming that we're not doing any type of upgrade to the collection system. Um, so no, you know, no capital spending. Um, the revenue adjustments are just based on the annual inflation and what what's needed to uh, bring our reserves to target levels. Um, since the wastewater monthly charges are already very substantial for the Bear Creek Estates customers, um, we thought this would be, you know, a better approach since the. Um, connection to the county is outside of the five-year rate setting period. Um, so, you know, we think it'd be prudent and helpful to the Bear Creek customers to defer the funding until a more concrete project can be, be proposed and all grant funding options can be explored. Um, and I, Rick, I don't know if you wanted to- No, you did a fantastic job. Talk uh, more about the, the, the Bear Creek uh, working with the county uh, would be uh, a, a um, 
an expansion of the county's CSA 7, which is the wastewater system uh, at the Bullet Creek Golf Course. The plan and what is uh, looking to move ahead is combining uh, the downtown Boulder Creek and areas uh, in the CZU fire along Big Basin Way into the uh, sewer system and also bring the Bear Creek Estates uh, wastewater down to Boulder Creek and then out to the golf course combining with CSA 7. Um, it's a much bigger customer base and, and our initial studies with the county bring in it would tentatively lower the monthly maintenance cost to about 50% of what they're paying now. It's a very significant lowering because there's much more connections and it's a, it's a much better system. Um, the one thing though about this is it has a long time frame, 10 to 12 years, uh, the county estimates. But we are looking for um, grant funding. There, we hope to find grant funding to cover most of this. Uh, we feel that, you know, if we really don't have any projects to start building um, a, a capital uh, improvement, we don't have a project, so it, it's tough to sell that to the folks at Bear Creek, tell them we want to raise their rates if we don't have a project. Um, yes, we're not in compliance, um, but the, the Regional Water Quality Control Board knows that the district and county are working and I think everybody involved sees this uh, as the final fix to the Bear Creek and the downtown Boulder Creek area. We could spend money, we could spend a couple million dollars on upgrading what we have out there now. The operational costs um, would cost those folks more than they could afford, would almost double it. Um, so at this time, we're just kind of staying in status quo. We definitely have a little to build up their capital reserve because that is, uh, they have almost no capital reserve right now. And then we're gonna continue to uh, explore uh, grant funding for the, the final project on Bear Creek. Thank you. And, and then I forgot to share this screen. This just shows the 3% for the five years uh, revenue adjustments that would be needed under, if we were to select this financial plan, which is the no capital spending. Um, and so then with that, we have a motion, um, and I can put the question. Okay. All right. Um, why don't we start with Jeff, uh, participated in the budget and finance committee. So I'm actually very familiar with this and know what you've been doing, and I'm quite happy with it as it is. I'm not, uh, I don't really have any questions at this point. Okay. All right. Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I, there's just two things I'd like to emphasize before we sort of open this up for wider discussion. Um, already what we've heard from Kendra and Rick is explained why we've ended up where we are and what the motion is in the packet for the board to consider. But what I want to um, just say is that the proposed financial plans and the revenue model are just that, models. And models never capture reality perfectly. Um, they're just our best attempts at um, trying to understand things for the purposes of decision making. Um, their greatest value is in terms of just sort of putting the boundaries on what the possibilities are, not in exact predictions of the future. So for that reason, there's not much merit in quibbling about um, small aspects of the model or changing input variables a little bit. As Kendra explained, we, we already had Ralph tell us do some minor changes based on comments that we got from the board and budget and finance. And so that accounts for the changes between September 7 and, 7 and September 14th. And since then, um, Kendra, Rick, and I have worked with Ref Tellus to do a little bit further modeling based on some comments that we got on the 14th, answering questions like, what would happen if you spread out some of the capital projects over a little bit more time, like if you took $5 million and you spread it out? Or what if we took out a slightly smaller loan, $16 million rather than $19 million? Or what if you took out two smaller loans spread out over time? And what it turns out is that those kinds of changes have very little effect on the amount of revenue that we need. You have to make much bigger changes, like cutting the amount of capital expenditures that we would have for uh, recovery in half, or um, cutting the, uh, or, or doubling them, or you'd have to cut the loan amount in half for it to have any effect. And then the second thing I'd like to emphasize is, is just to remind people that 
Tonight, what we're really voting on is just on the first stage of the rate study process. And that is the financial plan and the revenue model that sets the amount of revenue that we need to capture in the new rate structure for the next five years. It does not set the actual rates that our customers will pay, which is what's taken up in the next step. And just as an example, if we have, say, a 10% um, increase in revenue, that does not automatically translate to a 10% increase in rates that our customers will see. Because, for example, were we to adopt tiered rates, lower um, use people would probably see an increase less than 10%. And then foolish people like me that have swimming pools would see an increase above 10%. The other thing is that will be part of this next step is deciding whether we want to assign parts of the revenue to restricted accounts that could be used only for specific purposes. And these might be things like disaster recovery, other types of capital projects, a drought reserve, or watershed protection and also decide whether we would want such categories reflected in the rate schedule and on the customer's bills. So it was transparent to our rate payers exactly where their money is, is going. None of these things are on the table tonight because they are part of the next stage of the rate study process when there'll be ample time to take them up for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Bob? I want to make sure I understood what it is that we're being asked to vote on. Are we being asked to vote on the financial model that was delivered, at least to me, a week and a half ago or so? Is that what we're adopting along with the low um, capital expenditure associated with the raw water line? Just the financial plan. That, uh, that was presented in my presentation. So basically the same from the waste, the uh, water is the same from the September 14th uh, meeting with you know, some slight updates to what we're calling the scenario. Um, and then the wastewater would be step, is a new financial plan that we're um, suggesting, recommending um, based on no capital upgrade spending, just on regular inflation and um, bringing our reserve levels to target levels. Yeah, sorry, I need to be very specific. So. The model that was delivered showed a particular plan for revenue and operating expenses, operating expenses growth about four and a half percent a year. That's what we're being asked to vote on. I mean, I don't know when you were it was sent to you, but there could have been changes made since then. Um, but the, so yeah, I guess the, what was presented to you tonight was a product of the model. I mean, I'm I'm uncomfortable voting on financial plans that have bar graphs basically as the as the output or for what I'm what I'm supposed to be looking at. That's why I'm trying to relate it to the model that I got, whether or not we're voting on that or voting on something different. Um, it, it sounds like it's still very um, flexible and. Um, I understand what you said earlier about this being a model, Gail, but we are at, we will eventually be asking our community to do more than just participate in the model. They're going to have to open their checkbooks and give us money. And that needs to be a bilateral commitment. And right now, we haven't made that commitment as a district, as a board. But we're so, so, so we're. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm voting on right now because, uh, and also for the community, um, I'm assuming that the that the attachments were meant to be hot links. Is that correct? Yes. They're not working on mine, unfortunately. So I'm I'm uh, the community may not be able to access that either. Um, Okay, uh, on the Bear Creek Estates, we're showing a 3% increase in rates. Revenue. Adjustment. Revenue. Um, how much of that, you, you also say that we're going to be raising it modestly and then creating a reserve. What, what's, what's the split between 
operating in reserve out of that 3%? Mm, that I would have to look into further. Um, it's just, I mean, it's a blend of, you know, the uh, assumptions from the inflation, which were are consistent with the water um, financial plan, and then also bringing the target, the reserves to target level. Well, what um, so what I mean, would that number be, the target level? Uh, let's see here. And what would that be based on? Our reserve policy. Two and a half percent of the cost of the infrastructure. Yes. Okay. So what would that number be that we expect to have in the uh, dedicated for reserves at the end of this five-year period? Uh, let's see here. It's on the graph. It's yeah, it's, it's on the graph. I just, I don't have the... Sorry, I, I'd, I'd be happy to look at it more, but I wasn't able to get to it before tonight's meeting. Well, it should be in the memo. Oh, here we go. Um, so it looks like for fiscal year 25, we're up to um, 100,000. Fiscal year 26, 200,000. Um, fiscal year 27, a little over two, like 250,000. And then by fiscal year 2028, uh, 300,000. Okay, so we're building reserves, but it, yeah. it isn't going to be at the target level at the end of five years. Yeah, it will be above the target level. If you look at the graph, the um, the reserve target is the black line. And so we're under in fiscal year 24, 25, but as of fiscal year 26, we are above the reserve Page level. Page 12, the agenda. Yeah. Page 12 on the agenda. Somebody's dog. Fine. Okay, so we're valuing the current um, capital infrastructure there at eight million dollars. Now we're taking two and a half percent of that, and we're building up to that. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Jamie. Um, do we incur any kind of violation for being out of compliance on the wastewater side? Is there, aside from getting notices, you know, is there any other mitigation that we're required to do? We are out of compliance right, um, right now. Um, and we are reporting that quarterly and working with them. They have not been aggressive towards us as long as we're continuing to try to come up with a solution. And I do believe that they're also supporting the CSA 7 uh, uh, consolidation. So they haven't been aggressive towards us, but yes, we are in, in uh, non-compliance uh, by the nitrogen, uh, exceeding the 50% nitrogen reduction and I and I in the uh, collection system. Is there any... Um... Uh, legal jeopardy that that opens us up to, like from lawsuits, perhaps from other water users of the San Lorenzo River. I mean, I think anything's possible because you know, look at the city of Santa Cruz, where nitrate issues are a concern in the San Lorenzo River, and obviously, it's right along Bear Creek, and Bear Creek flows into the San Lorenzo River. But you know, those are all monitored. There's water quality samples in that. It's a very little, and I think it's almost negligent that we increase nitrate from Bear Creek, yeah. but we're not meeting the 50% right. reduction. Right. So, you know, anything's possible, uh, Jamie. Um, I wouldn't say no to that, but highly unlikely. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I'm in agreement that raising the rates without a clear project is a real challenge in terms of what we're asking the community. But I obviously, you know, have concerns in terms of our environmental stewardship of the watership, watershed that we're responsible for. Um, I, I wanted to clarify my understanding of the conversation that we're having tonight. Um, I, I think what we're looking at is, is the basis on which we are going to then consider how we structure our rates. The model is a tool that gets us there. It's the outputs from the tool that we're now taking a look at, right? And so I um, feel like we have done our due diligence here in terms of considering uh, how we might adjust the model to ensure that we are giving our community the best understanding of the basis 
on which we are next going to consider our rate structure. Um, and it is not our job as the board, my understanding, to then dictate the terms of the tool that is being used to give us these answers, right? So, so the, the model's a tool, the outcomes are what we're considering. Is that fair? Well, I mean, we do have some control, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, so the once we select a financial plan based on the model, from there, you know, the uh, Raptelis will structure, um, you know, the rates and what the in the five year rate schedule is going to be for each uh, for the customers and take into consider consideration alternative rate structures like Gail mentioned, you know, like potential capital improvement surcharge or drought surcharge or whatnot. Um, but, you know, it's my understanding that once we select the financial plan, we won't be making any changes to the model because that's what the, you know, financial plan is based on from what we select. Thank you. I'd love to hear what Director Mayhood was going to say. Uh, I was only going to say that the we're we're not given the model by Raftelis and and then it you know comes down on stone. We we obviously have made some changes to some of the input values and we've provided some feedback right, for it. But you're absolutely right that that after that's happened, then the result of the model is what we're using. Got it. Thank you. Um, in the presentation that you put together. I saw the statement in here that uh, the revenue model has uh, 25 million over a five year period, but it requires reserves to be used for emergency uh, projects. Um, while at the same time, we're uh, recognizing that our reserves are too low right now. So how are we balancing uh, those two? Uh, we're low right now, but we're saying that we're going to be using the reserves for emergency projects. So that's where the debt issuance comes into play. So, um, you know, the all of the FEMA projects, we have to pay up front until we receive mm -hmm. reimbursement. Um, you know, and reimbursement can be one to two years or whatever right. it may be down the line. So to make sure we have enough cash flow coverage, we need to issue that debt um, to ensure we can pay for those capital expenditures. So, so it basically is issuing debt to make sure our reserves are not depleted anymore. Um, I like what you've done with the wastewater plan changes uh, based on input that we received from the community. Uh, at the last meeting um, and the comments on that and being able to go back and look and see uh, when we would be doing uh, that uh, lateral to tie into the county's new system. With, I think the county's on a, an 11 year program to eventually get to that point. We're not gonna be needing to do any of this in the next five years. Probably it's on the order of more like eight or 10 years out that we would be doing something for that. So good. Um, and um, the district has done a lot uh, since we inherited that uh, wastewater treatment system in, in an effort to do upgrades to it, uh, but, they, but the district has still not been 100% successful. We reduced it some, but still not completely successful on that. So, I do recognize that. Um, and the uh, 25 million for the replacement of the raw water pipeline, I think is uh, appropriate. And this is the correct approach for us to be taking at this point. So um, with that, I'd Mr. like- Smalley, just yeah. Mark Lee has been patiently having his hand up since interested citizens, uh, he would like to address the board and he doesn't think we're seeing him. Oh, okay. Uh, Brian or uh, Mark Lee. Uh, Mark Lee or Dolphin sent a text in. We haven't taken uh, public comment yet. Right. Okay. When so I get you know, when, okay, when I get to public uh, comments, I will uh, address him then. Okay. Uh, so uh, at this point, um, I'd like to read out the motion and then uh, solicit public comment. Excuse me, point of order. Would it be possible to split the motion into two? 
Um, I'd like to read the motion um, as we have it here um, and go from there. If uh, somebody wants to make a, uh, an amendment to this, we can, mm -hmm. we can consider that then. Um, but I'm going to read this uh, so that we all have it on the record. Move that the board instruct the staff and Reptilis consultants to use the modest disaster recovery spending financial plan described in this memo to develop possible water rate structures for the board's future consideration and to use the no spending for major upgrade financial plan described in this memo to establish a recommendation for the rate structure for the wastewater usage at Bear Creek Estates. Second. Okay. So with that uh, out there, I'd like to solicit public comments um, on what we've discussed here. Uh, anybody here in the audience? Uh, Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I guess what I've been hearing is the district is going to borrow its way to reserves. But that's not the way I think of reserves. <laughs> um, I think of reserves as something that could be used for any purpose. They're held in reserve. They're not committed to something that's already going on. Um, so I, I think and I kind of wonder where, where everybody came from that you think that you can borrow $19 million and call that reserves. I mean, that's what I've been hearing, isn't it? Um, the district got into two long-term debts in the last few years, and there's financial information in the back of it. The, the district borrowed $29.5 million uh, two and a half years ago and more than four years ago. And the, the financial information here shows that there's, as of um, August 31st, there was still 17 million of the 29 and a half that had not even been spent. And now you want to go borrow another 19 million. Um, I have never heard of this kind of financing. I don't understand. Um, I guess, um, if you, I have my own model for the life cycle of a project, uh, and construction projects included. Uh, and my model is, I wish there was a whiteboard I could draw this. It's an S curve. You start out slowly, you ramp up, you eventually hit your stride and you have an inflection point when you're spending most of your money. And then maybe it levels off at the top and you fit do the finishing touches. So you have an S curve to a project. And it looks like these projects that began in 2019, that S-curve, the inflection point, is three years, three years or more out, which I think there's some IRS code that says three years is the limit. I'm not quite sure how you've gotten past three years. Um, but the way, the kind of financing that the district has been getting into with these uh, certificates of participation, it looks like you borrow the full amount up front, and we start paying interest up front for the whole project. But meanwhile, this S curve doesn't really reach its inflection point for years in the future. So we're paying interest, and I guess you've already discovered last year that in this interval, you've got a treasury management problem. So it's not just a project management problem, it's a treasury management problem. What do I do with $19 million when I haven't figured out how to spend it? I, I've never seen this kind of financing. I mean, maybe Mr. Fultz, I know he's got a lot more experience than I do. I, I have no idea how this, it, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. Um, you have borrowed more than tens of millions of dollars for years and it's, you can't even spend it. You got 17 million that's totally committed to 
projects and you've got more, you want to do it again. Um, so the other thing I'm a little disturbed about is I came to the last meeting, you've already decided you're going to go with the above ground. I mean, it's sure sounded at the last meeting. Yes, the finance committee um, came to a consensus on an unagendized item last, and now it's the same thing for the debt. So there's $19 million of debt. It looks like it's a done deal. There Wrap never was any comments. process. Wrap up your comments, Bruce, and be told. I know you don't want to listen to me, but uh, you're in your third tier of, of borrowing money that you haven't even figured out how to spend. Thank you. Um, anybody else here? Like you said. So I'm Eric Martin, here local in Walden Creek, right by the proposed pump station, as probably everybody knows. Um, the, the construction company that's doing the work, um, anybody that lives on the other side of Highway 9. Is this focused to? It's part of the, it's part of the projects. And I don't know if you're aware of what's going on up there. Um, but right now we're commenting on this uh, budget model. Uh, we do have a... Uh, an engineering project summary that we will be discussing later in the meeting, but are your comments related to this revenue model? That we're well, I'll, I'll, I'll address the revenue model. Okay. Having no small amount of experience in the construction industry, I agree with what Mr. Holloway said. Um, borrowing money up front and then throwing it in the bank, unless you have a really good investment bro broker or banker, is a fool's errand. You borrow it as you use it. All of my construction projects that I did, my customers paid for them as in installments. They didn't just get give me $10 million up front and say, woohoo, go spend it. And I agree with that. There needs to be a more comprehensive project. And I do small, I did small stuff, and I don't know what he did, but I'm looking at this going, the, the math just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else here in the audience? Uh, otherwise, um, I will go to folks uh, attending remotely. Um, Mark Dolson. I'm sorry, I should have lowered my hand long ago. Okay. Um, and I've been informed that uh, Mark Lee would like to speak also. Is that correct? Uh, I don't see any. You might have to raise this hand. Okay. Um, we may be having communications with problems with Mark because he did text the person in the audience. So I understand, but I can't. Yeah. Can't pull it out of the ether. <laughs> this is true. Okay. All right. Uh, given that, then we've heard from the public. Oh, he put his hand up. Um, I'd like to uh, solicit any other. Comments from the board on our second round, Jamie. So, um, just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, are there uh, project financing rules that um, require us to demonstrate cash on hand in order to proceed through design and construction approvals? Or, are, you know, like what uh, seems to me, I understand why we need to finance the projects because we can't raise enough money with reserves fast enough unless everybody wants to look at 25% increases um, in order to have enough cash on hand to proceed through these projects. But I'm just wondering if there are financing rules um, that we deal with and you know, if those limit our ability to um, finance things closer to the date of actually implementing construction. To be honest, um, so I wasn't involved with the last loan, so this would kind of be my first, would have been my first time dealing with that. So that, um, I'm not familiar with that piece of the information. Rick, maybe you have a better idea. I was, I was thinking back to that, but, you know, I know that, you know, we didn't move ahead with projects until we were sure that we received the loans. Um, so we didn't want to go out and find out, you know, we weren't getting the loans. So one came in and then what happened, that money would have been spent if it wasn't for the supply chain backlog. And, you know, some of those projects were held up over a year during COVID and supply chain. That's why now that we have such a big backlog and we're spending, uh, well, we're in, we're in construction right now of uh, 15 million 
So we're catching up and that money will be spent shortly. That money is going out in, in, in large quantities. Um, so we will be catching up on that. But we like we like to make sure we have that money before we committed, you know, on projects and budget. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, I mean, at the last meeting, I or maybe the meeting before, I, I spoke about the fact that we're, uh, as a board, um, and through the numbers that were put together by our consultant, conflating real reserves with debt uh, in terms of how we're looking at things. Um, to classify debt as a reserve is insane. Um, but I understand that that's a typical thing that, that folks do. Um, because it is money that's available uh, to be spent. I, historically, since I was around for the last two loans, I think there was some optimism that the ramp up time for the projects would be much shorter. Um, as it turns out, um, you know, we took the loan out in 2019. Uh, at the end of that year, we start and in the first part of next year, we got into COVID. And then we got in 2021, we got into end the fire. And in 2021, I think there was just a lot of um, trying to do too many things at once, basically. Um, so I think we were overly optimistic at how quickly it would take us to uh, ramp up. What isn't clear for me on the loan is whether or not that 19 million is required in order to cover cash flow um, for uh, for the district. That is because of the incredible delays in getting FEMA reimbursement, um, we, we would run into a cash flow uh, situation. Uh, early on, I'd ask for more of a granular, um, and especially for the public, to be able to present a cash flow projection. Um, I think we got something, but I don't know that it was really clear showing exactly why that $19 million was was needed up front. Um, it, it is just unfortunately a fact of life that FEMA does not um, or has not been reimbursing us very quickly. And I think we're going to cover that here in another agenda item. The other thing about models, because uh, I do want to address the models, the models should reflect closer to reality. Um, the, mo the model that was used in the last rate increase talked about 3.5% increases in operating expenses. Our budgets that were actually passed were consistently in the 6% to 7% increases or three points over what was in the model. It, it is because of that that I'm skeptical that a model showing 4.5% increases in operating expenses given that inflation is now much higher than it was back then is in any way realistic. And it is that concern about making sure that we are presenting to the community a realistic model about operating expenses. It's really driving um, why I'm advocating so strongly for that. Um, I, I am willing to bet that the budgets that get passed will not be 4.5%. They'll probably be in the 6 to 7% range, uh, which would be anywhere from 3 to 4% over uh, the models. The, I understand the issue behind that, which is if you show the operating expenses increasing too quickly, you're then forced into higher rates. And so that, that is why I think there's this tendency to underestimate what the actual operating expense increase is gonna be in these models. And then what happens on the backside of that is you lose operating margin that then reduces our ability to um, have reserves available to us. And these are the reasons why the, the model that's been presented by our consultant, the numbers that have been presented by our consultant are not in anywhere um, related to what the reality is going to be. And it is for that reason that I, I, I simply can't support uh, this. I think, it's, um, I think it does a real disservice to our community when we don't present models that reflect reality. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to that nineteen million dollar loan, uh, is there any reason we would be taking that out sooner than what we would need to? No. Um, we mean sooner, like um, 
front loading it uh, to the point of having it in hand before uh, the engineering team said, here are the, here are the projects that we're gonna be having coming up next year. Uh, so that we would be holding it for years. I mean, in order to cover the capital expenditure needs, we would need to issue that debt. Okay. Um, and I mean, like the, the previous two loans, they those those funds are designated for a specific projects. Right. So it would be similar to that where we would designate, you know, specific projects to the loan funds. Um, so, but, you know, it is needed in the early on in the first year because of the big uh, capital expenditures we have in fiscal year 2024. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a motion in front of us. Um, did we get a second on yes. that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. That was me. Okay. President Smalley. Oh, excuse me. I'd, I'd like to offer an amendment to that, please. Okay. I think we have to vote on the motion before us that's been seconded. I don't think that you can amend can, the motion once it's been I, seconded. I, actually, you can. I'd love to hear from you the board. Can, you, can you comment for us? You could ask to do a counter motion and see if you get a second. Thank you. Okay. So, so feel free to make a counter motion, Bob. Well, actually, I definitely want to look into that a little bit more and all the boards I've been on once a motion has been seconded you can make an amendment so um, yeah we'll argue about it later so yes I would like to move that the board instruct the staff and Raphael's consultants to use the modest disaster recovery spending financial plan described in this memo to develop possible water rate structures for the board's consideration period second motion I move that the board instruct the staff. You, and can, you take one motion at a time. If you want to make two separate motions, you you do one motion at a time. You see, we get a second on the one motion. Okay. So Bob's put a motion out in front of us. Uh, do we have a second on that? Hearing none. Is there a reason to proceed with your second? Well, these are two very different questions, and I'd like to support one but not the other. But okay, if the board says I can't do that, that's fine. My apologies to the Bear Creek Estates people. Okay. Uh, right. That the board will not allow me to support them. I think it's the rules. Okay. That's we're, not the rules. We're following, the, we're following the protocol that our attorney is advising us on. Okay, we have a motion not in front of us. Holly, did you take the roll, please? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, new business. The Public Assistance and Disaster Recovery Management Services contract. Say that three times fast. Yes, and the environmental planner will present this item to the board. All right. All right. Thank you, Rick. Um, do you want me to move a microphone a little closer? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Because I think you you start off. All right, there we go. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> you're off to start off. Yeah. And then, then it <laughs> the page. All right. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right, so FEMA offers project management cost claims through category Z at a not to exceed rate of 5% reimbursement based on the total obligated project cost. In August 2020, the CZU lightning complex fires and December 2022 and 2023 storm events damaged or destroyed district infrastructure. This resulted in over 60 FEMA projects over the three disaster declarations. Due to staff bandwidth and the difficulty of reporting and compliance requirements associated with FEMA public assistance funding, the district released a request for proposals or RFP for public assistance and disaster recovery management services. Can you not hear me? <laughs> You're speaking really quickly. Oh, sorry. Running together and it's also I'm sorry. Okay, I'll slow down. 
Um, the RFP outlined the district's need to complete the FEMA public assistance and reimbursement process. The RFP closed on August 4th and two proposals were received. One from AFTM and another from Berquist Recovery Consulting or BRC. District staff reviewed both proposals and found that each were substantially different in cost and hours needed. On August 28th, the district sent out a project list shown as Exhibit D for the consultants to more accurately define hours and cost. However, the differences between the two proposals were still very great. After further review, district staff are recommending award to Aptum. Aptum's proposal clearly defined objectives, outlined a clear schedule, and laid out hours that realistically reflected the scope of work. Staff is prepared to answer any questions, and there's more detail in the memo. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know about the rest of the board, but I have a lot of questions on this. So uh, let's get started with the uh, I'm sort of here. I'll, I'll defer to you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then I prefer to uh, go last on this. Uh, Bob, are you prepared to on this thing? Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, Jamie, do you want to? I, I don't have. Or shall I? start into yeah why not yeah because i actually don't have a lot of comments about this i think it's an important okay. you know program right. and we just need to uh, award this contract uh, the rfp and the uh proposal win or the the proposal submittal uh they're both coming uh at us together here uh, the proposal or the rfp or the need for the rfp uh, wasn't reviewed with um i think the budget finance committee it was not okay uh, Rick, care to comment on that? It's, the, uh, it's been in development since I believe July. Right. I think, you know, it's thought it was pretty straightforward that there really wasn't a lot to it. Okay. That, you know, they needed no okay. scrutiny or. Um, this CZU fire estimate damage, you're now uh, paying at 75 million. That's what depending the on what we, you know, okay. depending on which way we go, and we have not determined yet uh, on the construction technique on the raw water. Right. But so that's your, it could be as much as that. Okay. But that's your estimate for right now. Could, yes. be, as, could be as much as that. Okay. And the 2023 storms, you pegged at $4 million in this. In this yeah, it's probably okay. going to be a little low, but. Okay. Uh, the RFP requests support for getting grants, um, and it spells that out, I don't know, in four bullets. Are those grants separate from FEMA funds, or is that grants that are kind of under this bigger FEMA umbrella? What FEMA, is, FEMA considers, they call that what their funds is grants. Okay, so it's seeking FEMA, FEMA funds in general. And FEMA FEMA funds. Like we're correct. Right. And yeah. they'll also look they at call other it projects or other grants to fund projects to help okay. us yeah. move forward. Okay. Um, and um, I want to quote as best disaster related work is further stretching staff capacity. Um, and, and well, uh, you're laughing, Kendra. Um, <clears throat> The fires happened three years ago, and, and I think, at least on the engineering side, I've been asking the question, do we need help? Do we need help? And I've been hearing, no, this is a bit of a change from what well, I've been hearing. So the, the problem so seems to be why. getting FEMA to respond, and, and these folks have a, the track record and the staffing to continually um, inquire with FEMA and to work through them and are generally seem to move to the top of the list okay. from what, when we spoke to uh, other uh, Northern California fires, mm -hmm. uh, Paradise and, and their forth. And then the same people are found with their insurance companies. It's very similar by bringing in a consultant to that understands the fine lines of FEMA or the insurance have a tendency to move it ahead faster. Okay. We're at a standstill on CZU. Okay. So have we been reimbursed anything for CCU fire costs yet? Um, or has it been so? Grand total is like 475,000. Oh. Yeah. Out of how much have we spent on CCU? Oh gosh, almost uh, 5 million, I want to say. And I do believe that uh, okay. 
Okay. That initial best for the reimbursement was for the emergency response. Yeah. Right. It was the nickel dime stuff uh, in the very yes. very beginning. Okay. And now okay. a large so project. Minimal, minimal so far. Right. And um, and keep in mind, not only we haven't received the money, Mark, but we haven't had these projects obligated to say that the, that yes. they will pay to do these right. projects. Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> who who will manage this consultant for us? We bring this consultant on. It would likely be the management team, um, which no, is no. who. Um, it, it, it will be it, it will be the management team depending on where it's at because there'll be finance, there'll be engineering, there'll be operations. Right. Okay. Um, so most likely it'll wind up the majority of it in in the engineering department, but also finance will have a great role involved okay. on that. Okay. So it will be. So I know what you're looking for. You want one individual that well, will coordinate the district this. manager. So it would be the district manager okay. who is responsible. Okay. Would be the point of question to would be the um, person. To tell this That's out. correct. Because can I see in <coughs> Excuse me. um Aptim? Is that General the general manager? Is that the Aptim? Yes. Aptim. Um they have a list of I don't know, twelve different personnel or so at varying rates that they would have involved in this. So it sounds somewhat similar. You would have the appropriate staff working with them, but with uh, district manager or general manager uh, as the point person uh, focused on this. Okay. Um, I see that Aptum's proposal provides for um, a little more than 2,000 hours over a two-year period. Um, that's one individual working half time. So I, I take that as a fair amount of uh, involvement over that period of time. And I realize it's not one individual that they're providing us because they all provide different levels of expertise into that. Um, it's providing for a two year period. Um, what's the likelihood that we're going to need this beyond two years, given where we're? where we are now i mean it's keep in mind it is a not to exceed contract so you know if they were to be able to finish up the work within you know one year i don't think we would extend we obviously wouldn't that's extend what he's asking I, I don't that's, that's, that's not the question only, okay that's only sorry well um what's the uh, recovery time frame for getting money from fee i think it's going to be longer than the two years um, given uh, where we, you know, what we've been able to recover so far, um, is it likely that if we're working successfully with a firm like this, that so so the big they're going to be coming back to the somebody else. Well, the big staff thing is going to be coming back to, them to say yes. The big thing is getting the project obligated because once the projects are obligated, that's when we can start submitting for all of our expenses incurred to date and whatnot. Um, and once they're obligated, you know, the the invoices that uh, whoever consultant we choose, those are also reimbursable as well. Um, and, you know, these companies have extensive knowledge in working with FEMA and working to move the project along and get it obligated. Right. Um, so, you know, having them to help us with that, especially with our, right. you know, short mm -hmm. staffing um, would okay. be beneficial to yeah. start getting reimbursement. Okay. It, it will be, it may be years because you got to remember they don't reimburse until the project's completed. Right. We pay. Well, so, but we'll break off from this company once obligated and once that we have a, a, a obligated project, which means as long as you don't go out of the scope of work, FEMA pays actual construction costs. So that, that's a benefit. Okay. Let me clarify one thing he said. If it's a large project, which you know the raw water pipelines would be and all that, right. it, and it is obligated, you can take project drawdowns. You don't have to wait till okay. the project completes to, to get the full funding. So okay. you can draw down what you've expensed to date. Okay. Um, on that so and i wasn't clear about um what you were saying earlier carly with the this project z level or category z not exceed so can we get 
um, Aptom's fees uh, covered by um, Exactly. So or, the or Category Z would, would, pretty pretty much would pay for this project management consultant. Okay. Um, it's not to exceed 5% of the total obligated project cost. Right. But at their current, we would need to have a project cost of seven and a half million. Roughly. Right. Okay. You know, a lot, a lot more, more than that. that. And, <laughs> and they re -expense for, uh, reimburse for our time spent as well. So we're, we track our right. time Understand that, but in the same category. This is a recoverable cost. That we have here, uh, if they are uh, successful in getting us, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, have we checked any references on Captain? We have not. They're actually from a reference. Um, yeah. From Paradise. Which from Paradise. Uh, we during the fire, we worked very closely with Paradise on water quality and so yeah. forth. So we established a relationship. Okay. With them, and this is their recommendation. Okay. Um, highly recommended. Okay, so yes, you do. Okay, and um, uh, a technical point on uh, page 17 of the contract uh, that we asked Aptum to sign already because I see their signature on it. You have the district council name no longer, or of course, Gina's name is still on that contract. So we okay. need to get that to us. Okay. Excuse right. me, I couldn't hear you. Uh, the uh, the name change, district oh. council. Oh, okay. Is that yes. correct yeah. on the contract that yeah. issued? Okay. All right. Um, that's, all of the, that's all of the questions that I have on it. Uh, to the rest of the board now. Jeff? So I believe I've got this right, but my, to put it in real simple terms, staff does not believe that the district has personnel who have the available time and the specific expertise to manage the claim process with FEMA in-house. And therefore, these are consultants who do that as a, for a living. And the belief is that we will be reimbursed more quickly and perhaps more richly uh, because of their expertise. Is that put it in a nutshell? Okay, that's that's what I thought. Okay. All right. And just yet one more thing that we have to uh, pay for up front. <laughs> so, but but I totally understand why this is necessary. Grant writer. Yeah. And the grant writer has Paid. more than exceeded our expectations. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm so. just grumbling. I'm not I'm not arguing against it. Right. I'm just understand that. <laughs> I'd like to move uh, that the district manager enter into a contract with Aptim in an amount not to exceed three hundred and sixty-five thousand one hundred and twenty-one dollars for the purpose of public assistance and disaster recovery management. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, public comments on this. Uh, anybody here? <laughs> Comment on that. Um, anybody online? I saw Mark Lee's uh, hand pop up for about six seconds, and it's gone now. Mark? I think he's having problems. Link here. Okay. Uh, not uh, seeing anybody else online. Um, okay. Holly, sorry, we come back to. Oh, that, I'm sorry. That, that's right. Yes, the second, a second round. Jeff. Yeah, the only thing I had a question on is whether or not they had some forecast on uh, how this would impact our cash flow. That is, are they going to be able to advance the reimbursements to the point where our cash flow requirements are not as severe? Are the are you asking the consultants are going to do that or are we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what that? what's when when you're talking with them about paying them this money? What it, and they're and they're really good at it, which is what I'm hearing. Are they going to be able to start delivering cash to us so that we can accelerate the cash flow from FEMA so that we can 
be a little bit more flexible in taking out that $19 million loan. That, that's our plan to get, to use this company to jumpstart free money to keep this, start getting our, our reimbursement. Did they give you any idea as to how long they thought it would take to ramp up on that? What that yeah, S curve I, I is looking at the question now, but I'm not sure they they gave us any projections of when they would say cash would start rolling in, Bob. Any any examples of previous clients in terms of when you're checking references, how quickly they were able to start getting money in the door? I and mean, that's really what we're paying them for here, right? Right. Is is making sure that we get obligated, but more importantly, that we get cash faster. Any? Yeah, I, I don't believe that question was was asked directly. Okay. Jane, any follow-up questions, please? Um, I, I don't have any follow-up questions. I, I, I uh, appreciate the concerns from Director Fultz about how quickly we can move this process forward. I think we're all eager to see FEMA begin reimbursing us as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I, I would assume that what Paradise shared with you about them was that we they saw you know improved returns um, by using these services or? Either that and Paradise had some issues with damage by not being obligated that being turned down. And, and so they had to go a different avenue and FEMA to finally get, like their pipe was damaged from steam and they wanted to re replace all of the pipe. And FEMA said, no, just the part that melted. And this company through testing and working through them got them to finally approve through the appeal process to replace all of the piping yeah. um, and all of the services. Paradise had, you know, being the first one that had this contamination and having issues, Paradise went through a lot of different problems, um, being the first one that we were fortunate to learn from Paradise. Right, and so one assumes that it would be foolish for any consulting organization to make a specific commitment about a timeline that FEMA is gonna pay us on because they actually don't have control over that, but what they can do is, help to speed the process because they have the time, the bandwidth and the expertise to navigate those conversations in a way that we just simply don't have staff that have dealt with the FEMA process often enough to have that expertise. And that's why, you know, when I saw the staff report, I immediately thought this is exactly the right thing that we need to do right now. I just wanted to add one comment to that, to sort of the process that we have been experiencing because we talk a lot about the history of what didn't get done or what didn't get spent when. There was a pandemic a CZU fire, a terrible series of winter storms. We lost our original director of engineering and had to replace him during this period. For, so for a long period, we were without that important staff uh, role. And so that slowed down our ability to move these projects forward. Then we hired someone who unfortunately passed away not very long into his tenure in that role. And you know that obviously has direct impacts. There have been other staffing changes. We've been unable to fill the project manager role, which was the role that was going to help us deal with these things. So I appreciate that staff has been trying to find paths and reaching dead ends for years. And this is gonna be a tool that will help us move forward at a time when we really need it. So. Um, I view this as staff augmentation. We don't have the expertise here right now. We don't have the bandwidth. Okay. Um, we have a motion in front of us that's been seconded. Holly, would you uh, take the vote on this, please? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. I beg your pardon? Yes. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, moving on to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to uh, 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 anything that's here? Um, moving on to district reports then. Um, department status reports. Uh, first up is engineering. Okay. Um, so, um, to the board members uh, first. Uh, yeah. I have a comment. Yeah. Bob? Yeah, I'll let Mr. Martin ask about his. I was curious about the fish ladder 
um, situation we have 10 days? Yeah, so I was just at the fish ladder today and they're currently placing the Roxo protection between the control weir and existing weir one. And uh, there were some difficulties placing the half ton rock on the opposite bank. So they're actually placing a uh, smaller class rock that's gonna be concreted in place. And that's currently what they're up to. And- um, They're still on schedule to get out of the we water. are asking for a one week extension from Fish and Wildlife. So we'll have until the 20th okay. to remove the coffer dam and the bypass. Um, it might uh, still be removed by the 13th, but that'll give us a little extra time in case it pushes another week. And as Fish and Wildlife said, yes. We've received the extension from the State Water Resource Control Board thus far well, with some extent with some extensive uh, water quality data sampling that we have to complete daily. Uh, but we have been granted that. And then the Fish and Wildlife, we're still waiting to hear back on. Okay, but I mean, the fact that one did is right. a good indication the other one probably will exactly. as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, Felton Heights situation, where are we on being able to move that one forward? So we received proposals for the survey and we just need to enter into the contract with the selected surveyor. Okay, well, that's good news. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Jamie? No problem. Okay, uh, I do have one question before I go out to the public for questions on this. Um, I see on Brecken Brain Four Springs, uh, Sam's is close to wrapping up uh, their portion of the work and they're gonna be ready to begin to prepare an RFP. Um, one of the uh, things that they're going to finalize are their cost estimates. Um, I'd like you to bring their cost estimate uh, back to the engineering and environmental committee so that we can take a look at that. And again, I'm concerned that their cost estimate is here. The EWR has given us this much of the money, uh, and uh, I want to be able to have, have that discussion as to uh, do with any shortfall based on our engineer's estimate. It's not the contractors, but it's at least the preliminary. It would be my pleasure to bring the cost estimate to the committee meeting. Okay, once, once you have that. Yeah. yeah, it's my understanding they're going to be done with that very soon. Okay, okay, good. All right, uh, so on the... Um, are you moving past engineering at this point? or I, I, I wanted to... Because we do have a... Citizen out there. There's, there's several folks here that have questions, I believe, on yes. the engineering projects that we're doing. So that's what I wanted to offer. Uh, so please. Uh, my name is Rocky DeForge. I live in the Fernwood area of North Glen Arbor. Not for questions uh, and comments about projects going on down there. Um, quick little background. I worked for PGE undergrad construction, gas and electric projects for the last 25 years, um, managing projects like this as well um when the project started down there uh, we were given notice um a five-day notice that uh, the project was starting <coughs> and uh the project started the next day but the notice we were given was five-day notice it was for another street the Boulder creek um the kind of the history about the water program the day down there it's been leaking for probably 30 years or more um there's probably been 50 to 70 leaks since we've been there the last 18 plus years. Um, and what our concerns are that it's, it's damaged the road base underneath it. The asphalt is all alligator from the continuous leaks that have been going on. Um, we really appreciate the work that's been going on recently to get done, but uh, the we're concerned about the restoration of the asphalt surface after you guys leave. Um, if you know, we want to know what the plan is for the restoration of the asphalt. Um, the contract you guys have during the work is just incredibly, incredibly incredible. Um, working with PG&E, I mean, if we did work like that, we would be sued left and right. The, this contractor, I mean, they don't use traffic control, they don't use cones, they don't use signs, they have open trenches. I got pictures of an eight-year-old gentleman carrying groceries, stepping over a trench with nobody around. 
They don't direct traffic. They close the roads down. They don't tell the fire department. They don't tell the post office. They don't tell the residents. Um, I have a business there. They don't. They just literally shut it down to my customers. They tell us my daughter drives my wife. It's closed. Period. <clears throat> I know that the uh, the post office has had concerns. They talked to the foreman, um, maybe to the project manager before. Um, the, the project's been managed terribly, terribly. Um, the uh, I'm just like looking at the end of this project going. I hope it's coming to you know to a close quickly because it's just it's terrible. The traffic impact has been horrendous. Um, the restoration. I, I really hope we talked to talked to Derek once. I talked to Cameron. He's been great. Um, they said they're going to overlay the asphalt. I really hope that's not the only fix that's going to be complete because the road base below the, the existing asphalt is wasted. It needs to be asphalt removed, recompacted, and new asphalt put on. Um, on Hermosa Oak, especially Fernwood, I mean, literally, the, the we come down the road, I mean, literally, the water's leaking out of holes they just fixed the day before. I mean, there's, I'm not exaggerating, 50 to 70 leaves on those three streets. I mean, we, we call it documentation by emails and <clears throat> so we appreciate the work that's being done, the, but the the way the contractor doing the work just unbelievable, unbelievable. We've talked to the foreman numerous times. Um, and I think the only saving grace is that they're off our street right now, they're somewhere else. Um, they, they've literally piled dirt up against our redwood fences, it's been sitting there for the last couple of weeks without talking to you know the customer. I think that's just like, again, in my world, the pg &E, if we were to do stuff like that, messing people's driveways up, literally putting equipment in people's driveways, um, it, it just blows, it blows my mind. Without blows permission, mind. no yeah, permission at all. I, I have to apologize yeah. for the level of work that the contractor is doing out there, but I do want to ask Rick, are you aware of this? Yes. And I've, I've spoke with the neighbors. We did get off to uh, consider a, a, a bad start down there. The contractor is extremely messy. I agree. It's not the easiest thing in the world to control contractors, but we have we have staff down there all day long. Cameron's down there as an inspector. Garrett's spending time down there. Um, I don't believe that Rocky's exaggerating. I, I think he's right on. Uh, I, I have talked with, with Garrett about uh, uh, conversing with the county because they are county roads to talk to them about, you know, reestablishing the roadway to the depth of, of what we should do to repair, not just the overlay. Right. Um, you know, uh, that pipeline was, we had pipe that one, uh, actually that pipe was replaced not that long ago, but we had to have, uh, we must have got some type of defective pipe because the pipe developed pinhole leaks like a soaker hose and has been a terrible problem down there, not exaggerating the amount of leaks um, for the last few years. You know, that's why it's being replaced, but um, there is a lot of cleanup. And I have to agree that um, a better job needs to be done down there and that uh, we need to get the contractor to clean that mess up. And, you know, we do hold the purse strings and we will ensure that the road and the yards and everything are put back uh, to the pre-existing. We'll do a walkthrough in the neighborhood um, and, and make sure that we make this as right as possible. Okay. Um, I would like to hear about this project uh, at our next board meeting. Yeah. So, uh, with that, okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to ask on the engineering projects? Eric Martin from Boulder Creek again. Uh, just to carry on with what this gentleman was talking about, um, the construction company is absolutely horrible. No traffic control. Uh, 236, anybody that lives on that side of Highway 9, 20 to 30 minutes. And if they're smart enough to go to West Park, uh, this morning the 10-wheel dump trucks started going down the street at 40 miles an hour at 25 mile an hour posted at quarter to seven. 
backup alarms, loaders, all kinds of stuff going on. This in any other planet would just be not accepted. The, the complete lack of traffic control or even concern for the people that, that live in the area. When I see a 10 cubic, yard, 10 cubic yard dump truck going by at 40 miles an hour where people are walking with their kids and their dogs, um, I get a little excited because what's gonna happen? They're gonna run over somebody. They don't stop at the stoplight at West Park and Ridge. I haven't seen one truck, so granite, every single granite truck has blown through that stop sign uh, probably for the last two weeks, maybe three that I've been paying attention. And the same thing with all of their, all their equipment. The, the yard that they, they've taken over at the corner of West Park and Ridge, it looks like an industrial dump. And that starts at 6.30 in the morning. And it just continues on and on and on. It's a, it's a nose to tail stream of heavy equipment, backup alarms. My house, we today had to have all the doors and windows closed because the trucks were going by blowing up so much dust that we couldn't even put our food out on the table. So that's what you brought to our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, I do have to ask Rick, is this the same contractor that's doing both of these or is this the same project? I'm not well, there's, well, if they are actually granite, I don't believe we have granite working for us, but it may be. Granite delivery. Okay, go granite delivery. Sorry, okay, that's a cement truck channel. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, but the dump trucks, I, there's multiple projects going along 236 and West Park, but I do know that we have had these issues okay. uh, with the contractor, and we're to the point that we're, we're just going to have to stop work to get these, just an issue, stop work notice to get these contractors' attention because it's a daily event trying to get them. And I, I, I agree, you know, they're driving too fast at times. But you talk to them, it's, it's difficult to get control of the project. We're a dead end street. So when they come up and they're looking around, oh, they're hauling. I mean, they're going. No, I, I, I totally understand your concern. Um, but, but there are contractors. Do we need to go so far as to shut them down for that, that's probably the our our final res, uh, resort to be. We would have to shut them down because Garrett has spent time with them. Cameron has spent time out them. We've asked them not to start. They do have working hours. Then I think, we, and we have a construction management firm. Well, the construction management firm is not on this project. This is our project. We're managing. Okay. Um, do we need do we need another help? What's the name of the contractor that we put on this project? JMB. JMB. Thank you. They've done more damage than repair. They damage, they may fix the pipe, but then they're breaking up the road, they're dumping things in people's driveway, they can't come home. Yeah, some of that is, and I agree, it's missed, but some of that's part of the construction, and they will clean up. We will ensure that they do clean this up and, and repair anything they damage. Some of that is part of the you know, these roads are so narrow and it is difficult to work on there, but it doesn't excuse uh, it at the final. Um, and we will we, we will address this more. Do we do we issue a stop work notice? Uh, I'd like you to talk to our attorney. I think we'll talk to legal counsel first and, yes, uh, and please. before we go deeper into this tonight here at a public meeting. And um, yes. we'll see what our options are. I'll okay. speak with Garrett and we'll look at our contracts and we can go from there. Okay. All right. Okay. Can I throw some, one small thing out? If you um, want to control the traffic, have CHP grab another uh, alternative uh, called CHP and complaint. They won't do anything. They won't listen to us. I'd like to put a hold on, on that. Um, yeah, I, I, Rick actually addressed it again of, of referring to the contract. I, I would be curious at maybe one of our engineering committee meetings to have a review of our, con our contracts. Because if we don't have any mechanisms in the contract to control behavior, our ability to do anything, shutdowns is going to be limited. Well, Garrett and I have already spoke to that to make sure and we're keeping a running list of what we need to, like for, for instance, the storage yard needs to be fenced and that's not in. We don't have to cover it now. But so we will talk update to, our, talk to our, our specifications. And see what we can do to right. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. To get, the, to get this back under control. Agreed. Uh, 
they're driving, they're describing trucks that are going well above the speed limit. Is there a, a an accident waiting to happen there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Liability that, that, that you guys. That they're going to be so okay. We right. actually will um, block our, our entrance to our driveway or whatever with their sand and their gravel on it. And then people are trying to drive around it. And they're telling neighbors to go into other neighbors' property and park. Yeah. And trenches aren't being we parked. Stop. I want to encourage stop. that we have a so, public comment and not a two-way conversation yeah, because this is a board meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for the comments on this. The district management staff is aware of it. Okay. Uh, other questions then on the engineering reports. I looked at the minutes of the engineering meeting, uh, which I attended, and um, I thought that there was some decision or some recommendation made about taking out the 500 trees along the Pevine pipeline. As I recall, the district manager doesn't even want anybody walking out there to look at the, the, the place where the pipeline used to be. Um, and I thought we discussed this, and, and I didn't see anything in the minutes about it. So does the district need to borrow $19 million before they can take out the trees along the Piedmont Park line? Um, we've asked the district manager to get a contract for tree removals. I do believe we're out to bid, or we're getting ready to be out to bid. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Um, um, understand that the minutes don't necessarily reflect everything. Any comments from uh, members of the public online regarding this? Um, if not, I'd like to see if we could move on to uh, the environmental uh, reports. Uh, Jamie? Um, um, on the grants ongoing section, Charlie, um, are all of these in process or did we receive money and some of them and if we did when did we receive the money yeah so i think i believe the table was put into the memo this time it's, I, it, it's, it's so so it's tiny so hard to read I see. And yeah an embedded uh, spreadsheet might help right okay we can we can make that change um so the irwm has been awarded which is for the hardening of the pump stations the wooden pump station structures and then the I'm going through them. Uh, proposition one, that's that one. The fuel reduction has been awarded, but we're waiting on um, a couple different agencies who are running those projects. That's Cal Fire grants. And then the other, the USDA one, we're looking into this next week with our grant writer to see if it's a possible fit. Um, okay. Yeah, because while the grant money is still out there, we definitely want to go after as much as we can. Right. Are we still on track for the um, habitat conservation plan to come to the committee in October? I believe so. Yeah, uh, Jody's understands that we're trying to update the committee and the board, and she'll be prepared with a schedule. Right, I'll make sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I do have one question on the environmental. Uh, there's a. A reference uh, for the Alta Via project, uh, FEMA meeting for the environmental historic historical preservation. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> what's as part of the FEMA process, you have to go through an EHP review, which is environmental and historic preservation, where they pretty much check off the NEPA requirements. So we do go through CEQA, uh, but then there's the NEPA, which is the federal National. level. Mm -hmm. So we checked we checked the state, but we didn't check the next. So now we have to go through. So that. is the project? Uh, We're trying to not have it go on to pause. Um, they they want to start the work in the next two weeks. We have a meeting with FEMA tomorrow. Okay. Um, unfortunately, how FEMA likes to organize is instead of just having a call or an email, they want to organize a twenty person meeting, uh, which is really difficult to schedule um, with everyone's time. So we finally got it on the calendar for tomorrow. Um, okay. And I would hope that this is uh, the flag putting up for us uh, on other projects that have FEMA involvement. Uh, this is going to be. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you need a firm uh, advising you on the FEMA projects. Do you know anybody <laughs> like 
<laughs> some, some of the scrub through the cracks when we lost Josh because it was it, he was on it. I understand it, it dropped through the cracks. I'm not blaming it just happened. But um, sounds like you need an outside firm. Anybody? <laughs> I'm joking. Come on. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, moving on then. Uh, questions on uh, uh, finance, uh, Josh. Yeah. Bob? No. Jamie? Okay. Uh, committee reports, uh, oral communi uh, written communications. Um, I see nothing uh, there that we need to bring up. Um, I do want to bring up one email communication that we received uh, from uh, Kelly Fuller. Uh, an email uh, from an incident or something on uh, 433 Western Avenue in Brookdale. Um, could you? Is, is that part of the agenda? It's not part of the agenda, uh, but since we've addressed, addressed it. Okay, then then in a future meeting, just yeah, we we have addressed it with her her and gave her guidelines okay. uh, on that. Okay, I have questions about that, so I'd like to cover that in a future meeting. Okay, okay, then. Rick, did you? We'd like to cover that in a future meeting. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what what is. Yeah, uh, I meeting. have her printed email here. I can leave it with you. This is from Kelly. Um, oh, I have. And so I'm. I know. I'll talk to legal counsel. It may have to be in a closed session because this is pending litigation at this time. Okay. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, uh, given that, um, I think we can adjourn. Thanks, sure everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.